Thank you for joining us. So I am honored to welcome Dr. Asma Abdul Halim. She is with the Center for Muslim Women with the University of Toledo, and she will be giving our Sunday lecture today on Do Not Convince About Muslim Women. So I'll give you the microphone. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, um, let me start with the center. Uh, the center of the Muslim woman uh, is an idea that I came up with because there are, the main thing is that there are so many questions about Muslim women and Muslim women's rights uh, in Islam. So what I did is come up with the center and the college agreed, the College uh, of uh, Arts and Letters agreed, and now it is working. However, because we don't have any hired person to sit there, volunteer, we make appointments. Anyone who wants an appointment can come to the center by uh, appointment until uh, we find we are applying for um, a graduate student to be there at uh, uh, the center. And, and on this subject, I'm glad Sarah asked me to do that because what we know, uh, even as Muslims, we have differences on what we know about Islam, what we know about Muslim women and uh, their rights. So I will start with um, the title I have here is The Danger of the One Story. An African woman, a Nigerian woman, uh, did a TED talk on the danger of the one story. There is one story about Muslim women. There is one story about Islam. There is one story about Africa, for example. Uh, despite the fact that uh, I think African uh, Muslims uh, outnumber uh, the uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, Muslims and the Asian Muslims outnumber all. And in, uh, in uh, thing. so uh, we are trying to debunk some of the myths that come out of the one story. There is no one story about any religion, and specifically about Islam. Perhaps there is one basic story, but then Islam travels from one place to the other. Most of the time we mix our cultures with our religion because we want those cultures to survive. So the best way to keep a culture surviving is to attach it to Islam. Some of the um, uh, uh, questions is that do Muslim women have human rights? Are there human rights in Islam? Of course, there is, of course, two types of Islam, Shia, Muslim, uh, Sunni, but within the Sunni, there are different types. So I am going, my talk is going to be about the Sunni Islam, that's what I belong to, because I know more about that than about the uh, Shia. Sect. There is a restrictive, very restrictive, like the Taliban, for example, who are women are to be fed, closed, then have children and sit at home which is in effect reducing a woman's humanity. You can have any other animal to do that and, and sit at home. The physical care of children is left to the women and the education is left specifically of male children is left to uh, the men. And I am so glad one question that always comes up is not coming up anymore. Islam does not allow women to drive. The poor women in Saudi Arabia cannot drive. Well, okay, now they can drive. And they are still Muslims. They didn't have to leave Islam to get a license to drive. And despite the fact that they have licenses to drive, they prefer to have drivers. Why? Why do you think Saudi women, despite having this long awaited for, right, would they still pro, uh, prefer to have drivers? Yes, but then this, I think there is a regulation now that if there is an accident that 
you know, um, a, a woman is in the accident, rest assured that you are wrong, the man. We will always wrong you with a man because you have been cutting these women on uh, uh, the roads. But then because it's a menial job, Saudi women lived all their lives for perhaps uh, the past decades uh, knowing that driving is a menial job. They don't want to do it. They want their driver's license as of right, but they will still have drivers. Um, yes. Is, is there a difference between age, you know, like maybe older women prefer a driver and younger women prefer to drive, or that's not the case? Well, that is the case. That is the case. Thank you for bringing it up because, you know, there is more education within the younger generation than the older generation. There is more to learn about Islam in colleges for the younger generation. Okay. So within that, you find the older women prefer and they discourage the younger women because it's a menial job. Come on, have a driver. Yes. Yeah. Drivers in there don't take too much money, like the salaries are cheap, so they don't mind having someone park the car, have someone, you know, carry the groceries, carry everything, and they just sit and relax. And some, I, I don't mind that, but uh, um, exactly <laughs> that's that is what the, that is the feeling there. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> Well, even men have drivers, so men have drivers too, and they sit and, 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 and usually they just sound the horn and someone will come out from the shop to take your order for whatever it is that you want to shop for. But um, the younger generation is for going on the streets and driving their own cars because they also have more rights than the older generation. A father now knows that his young daughter has more rights than his wife. He can get along fine with his wife, but perhaps they will have, you know, someone talking back to him now. His wife never talked back to him. And, and, and that creates some of the frictions, but um, fathers do not mind if they have daughters driving. The, some people, still will not have any woman in the family drive. Despite the fact that now the argument is, what do you mean she can't drive by herself? And then you put a stranger in the car, a man who is not related to her, not one of her mahrams, but he will drive her. Now that is wrong. Not the woman driving herself. Putting a stranger in the car is the wrong behavior. Okay, so, um, and, and, and every time people then ask, okay, you guys always sort of, um, let me go back on this. Uh, uh, tell us things about uh, Islam. For example, uh, fasting Ramadan. For some people that is abusive. How can you deprive someone from drinking water, eating? Okay, we eat at the end of the day. We don't have to convince you on religious basis. Ask your doctor if fasting is not good or good for you. In any denomination, in any religion you are, just ask a scientist who is that this fasting is bad or good. And then you will know why Muslims are okay with it. They will do it uh, in the hot summer, in the dark days of the days of the winter. It is done. And then Islam is rigid. There is no room for new ideas. This is the one story about Islam. That is a monolith. You can't get out there. Don't look at Islam, look at other religions. They have so many sects within the religion. So is an Islam. Why? Because there is a way to interpret it and the interpretation that goes for me may not go for her. We are still Muslims. This has not harmed Islam in any way, except in the way that 
we always come out with defensive. We want to defend Islam against something. And then people will say, well, the people who are doing the bad things are saying, it's in the Quran. God told us to do it. Well, no. You know the rules in Islam of what to do and when to do it. So Islam is not a monolith. Okay, do Muslim women have rights? Muslim and non-Muslims, yes. There is the restrictive and there are the interpretations. Um, women, for example, uh, everyone now we are talking about the financial part of it, the economics of it. Up until I think the 60s in New England, a woman cannot open a bank account or get a driver's license or any type of ID without her husband's or her father's permission. This disappeared in the 60s. In Islam, for the past 15 centuries, no one to this date in any sect has argued against the statement in Islam that economically, in the finances, man and woman in any relationship are separate entities. No one is responsible for the behavior of the other. No one is allowed to take just as of right from the other. These two separate entities, there is no argument in any type of Islam that you practice in, in, uh, in this world. So, oops. There are specific questions about the purda or hijab. Why? Why are Muslim women put against their will in a hijab? Against their will is something else. Because in Islam, the paramount idea in Islam is consent. In any behavior, in any relationship, in any transaction, consent is paramount. It has to be there. Some women, like most of us sitting here, I prefer to wear a scarf, prefer to wear long sleeves, okay? And that is fine. No one can tell anyone, oh, you are naked or you are this. Some women do not wear it, fine. There are circumstances where women are not even, for example, women my age, I am an old woman. So Islam, even in the Quran, and this scarf, that's fine. By, by age, by social status, and the social status has to be mentioned here, because during the Ottoman Empire, at in particular, covering the face is to identify women as free women. And enslaved women or lower class women are the ones who are without covering. So everyone wants to be one of those upper class, one of those respectable women, so they cover their face. Because in Islam, at the beginning of Islam, there is no covering of the face. The all there is that women, of course, there were no zippers and there were no buttons, and women have to have an opening here to get their heads into there. All they have to do is, and they wore scarves before Islam. So all they have to do is just pull this over this opening. The jib is this opening. So just put your scarf over it, and that's it. Whatever they, they were wearing, they haven't changed it. Okay, so when the purda is enforced by force or by law, then actually the women have a problem, but the bigger problem becomes that of the state. Because the purda that covers all now is used by so many people People, uh, women who would not wear a purda unless they are going to commit a crime. So the women, 
If they want to commit a crime, they pretend to be, to be women. If they want to enter a women's place, they would wear it, cover all, so that they would be allowed into a place of women. And it becomes a problem for the women who would like to cover because they will, all, they will always be suspects. It, it created another uh, form, another layer of suspicion within uh, the society. Uh, men have authority to beat women and children. In short, domestic violence is allowed in Islam. Well, no, sorry. <laughs> men cannot beat men cannot beat anyone. Okay? Violence is something that in retaliation in self-defense. Other than that, it doesn't happen. And I always put this into uh, my uh, writing or presentation because some students in my classes is that the minute we talk about Islam and women, they immediately, the first paragraph, the poor Muslim women get beaten all the time because God ordered men to beat them. Well, okay, let, let us talk first about all the time. Men have places to go, have jobs to do. They are not sitting there all the time to beat women. Number one. <laughs> Number two, this beating is mentioned in a very limited area, very limited space. And people who are going through Islam through the centuries have seen how it has progressed from one type of, you know, of treatment of people, and besides compare it to the uh, statistics, for example, of uh, every nine seconds, there is a woman beaten or physically abused in the United States. That the percentage is by a large lower, very low within the Muslim societies. Yes. Uh, forgive me, I'm going to say something that might shock you. Mm -hmm. Maybe shock my wife too. Okay. That uh, a verse in the Quran where you said what what you just said, it's said there in a limited way and in a limited circumstances. Why don't we take it out? Okay, it's not a matter of taking out because there are there are things in the, in the Quran that have been hunaka. Um, uh, I mean, there is nasr and there is nunsi. You will forget something here, and once you, it is forgotten, it is gone, just like a stoning. There is no stoning except for the shaitan. In, in, in the Quran. You see? The punishment for Zina used to be only for women. That they will be in closed places until Allah allows them a way out. So Allah allowed them a way out by equating them with men having the same punishment and the same social status. Okay, so it doesn't go out, but it goes with the time. Because Islam always, for naming, how do you name your children? Do not name your children in a way that they will be uh, odd in the community. Okay, choose naming of your children. So all the things that appear to be odd now, but not at another time, these are among where people, we don't take it out, it is just sitting there, just like the punishment, the first punishment for Zina, just about everything that is considered mensukh in, 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 in the Quran, but then it becomes 
changed. Changed in the sense that our behavior has changed. And men who, or Muslim men who beat women and children actually are not, are not enforcing the ayah. It is not an enforcer, it is pure physical abuse. But when they go in front of, uh, of uh, judges in Europe, in Europe, for example, in Germany, a judge, a woman was beaten by her husband and he was threatening to kill her. She applied for divorce. The judge said, and the judge was a woman, well, what can I do? She chose a religion that allows beating of women. So I am not going to give her a divorce. Was this a civil judge or a Sharia judge? Oh, it's a civil judge because there is no Sharia in Germany. Okay. okay. So the first thing is that the judge has moved from the German law into a law that does not exist, if it exists even in Islam. But it doesn't exist in Germany. Okay. The other thing, the whole Muslim society came with pickets, picketing the judge and the court, because what she said about Islam was insulting. And a man should not be beating his woman, his wife, his daughter, his cousin, anyone is not to be beaten in Islam. And they provided it to the, um, uh, to the Minister of Justice, I think, or the equivalent of the Ministry of Justice, where they changed the, the judge. And the, judge, the new judge applied the German law, where uh, he cannot beat her and then threaten her with uh, killing her. So this is, this is where the one story is harmful. Okay? And this is where we always think of, why don't we take this? Up? And people tell us that, actually. Why don't you take it out if you don't believe in it? No, I believe in it. It is in here, but it is not applicable. There are so many things in the Quran that are not applicable now, but we don't take them out. Okay? Some people try to um, go over what Ribuhuna, uh, give it another meaning. Like uh, it is from Daraba, and Daraba is Adribu fil Ard, meaning go about. But no, the, the, a word having two or three meanings. Those meanings are not interchangeable. For example, the word right. This is my right hand. When I say something, you say you are right. Okay. And then I have a right. Right have three meanings. They are not interchangeable. Like I, I, when I have a right, I can't say I have a right hand. I'll say I have a right. Haq. Okay. So here, trying to make this interchangeable is not very successful. What is happening is that you go with the time. Why we go with the time? Because Islam, in Islam, Islam is for everyone at all times. How are we going to apply something at all times without believing that certain things are not fit for this time? So the historical part of this is and, and the Darroj that is going steps and steps for uh, uh, doing something is found in the Quran. For the drinking, liquor. It started out, the beginning of Islam, it was fine. Then it was people would come to the mosque drunk. It became La Taqrabu Salata wa Sukara. You cannot go to the mosque or you cannot pray while you are drunk. And then, إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْأَسْلَامُ Forbidden. Okay? It goes with the time. It goes with people's behaviors. And we have all these things in the Quran, even al-qasas, even the stories that are being told in, 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 in the Quran, give us the right to find out what's in that story for us. Okay. Can we go with, no, you cannot beat your wife? Okay. 
also the change in the family. In the family culture, we used to have these extended families living in Ras, in, in the Sudan. I'm originally from Sudan. This I would call it a hosh, a huge complex that has my uncles and my aunts and my grandfather is ordering everyone there. And amazing. This has disappeared now and we are in a nuclear family. In the past, a woman can just go to her uncle's house and say her father is beating her. The uncle would keep her in his house until his brother that she is not coming back until he behaves. So are the wives or the son of the sons. She could just go to the father of her husband and complain. And the father would either send the man away or keep her in his house until the husband behaves, especially if he is drinking one or something like that. This has disappeared. We are nuclear families now. And even in the same town, we are living at different places in the, in, in the town. In that nuclear family, we have to change our behavior because the solutions we had before, we don't have them now. So we, into, we have into new solutions without taking anything out. Is that convincing answer? <laughs> Uh, uh, women are forced into homes of obedience. The, the, the terrible thing about home for obedience is that it is not in Islam at all. It came from the French. When they came to Egypt, they brought this law with them to Egypt. From Egypt it came to the Sudan. Why? Because at that time, in the 19th century, when a man marries a woman, he owns the woman. And he owns everything that she owns. Her money, her property, everything goes to the man. So when she leaves the matrimonial home, he calls the police. And the police will go find her and bring her back to the matrimonial. Because the husband owns the wife. This doesn't happen in Islam. And I will come to the, to the uh, ayah after this. Uh, women have to undergo circumcision, a cruel act. Granted. But what does Islam have to do with it? Nothing. It's never been mentioned. I mean, some people are calling, well, Umm Atiyah was circumcising a girl, and the Prophet came and said, well, uh, uh, be, be careful. No, not, not to cut her badly or something like that. For two reasons, that is not possible. It has never been mentioned anywhere that people in the Arabian Peninsula were circumcising women. The other thing, the Prophet does not go into the tents of those people or in the houses of those people to witness something like this. It just, that take anything in the Sira, in the Sunnah and fight, how the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was disciplined in his behavior because he wants the people, Muslim people to be disciplined in their behavior. And the other thing is that if it were in Islam, it would have traveled with Islam to Iran, to Iraq, to Asia, to places that they never know it, but it didn't. In the cradle of Islam, it didn't exist. So why are the Egyptians and the Sudanese and the Ethiopians and some of the African Muslims are practicing? Because remember what we mentioned before? You have a culture, you want to keep it, attach it to the religion. It gets its strength there. To the extent that we call uh, uh, one type of that circumcision Sunnah. We give it this, the name Sunnah because we want it to be attached to the religion. Why is the religion has never taken it anywhere? Well, now to the ayah. I think I have a translation here for uh, uh, verse 34 and 35 of Surah An-Nisa. 
الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما انفقوا من اموالهم فالصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله واللاتي تخافون واللاتي تخافون نشوزهن فعظوهن وهجروهن في المضاجع واضربوهن فان اطعنكم فلا تبغوا عليهن سبيلا ان الله كان عليا كبيرا 35 وان خفتم شقاق بينهما فابعثوا حكما من اهله وحكما من اهلها ان يريدا اصلاحا يوفق الله بينهما ان الله كان عليما خبيرا. Okay. Uh, anyone needs the translation, the English translation of this? The Arabic is fine? Probably for the audience who's watching online. Oh, okay. Men are the caretakers of women. As men have been provisioned by Allah over women and, ta and tasked with supporting them financially. And righteous women are devoutly obedient and who when alone protective of what Allah has entrusted them uh, with. And if you sense ill conduct, uh, here I think the, the, uh, the word that is being used now is uh, recalcitrance, which is uh, going over authority. Now here we have to have two, uh, the, the, the three things. Uh, and righteous women are devoutly obedient and when alone protective of what Allah has entrusted them with. And if you sense ill conduct from your woman, advise them, or women it should be, advise them first. If they persist, do not share their beds. But if they still persist, then discipline them gently. So here you see the, the belief of the interpreter is brought in. Because another interpret, interpretation is saying hit her. Another say beat her. Another one says strike her. Okay. Here, someone who believes that this striking or this beating should be gentle has entered it into the uh, the, the uh, interpretation. Surely Allah is most high, all great. Okay, so we have these three things. With people just pick for the Okay, which is the last result. And as we said, right now, for the is not going with the time. Because women's behavior is also different. Women have jobs. Uh, uh, women have know their rights. Uh, women are not afraid to go to court for divorces. All that is happening. But let us keep it as such and say, okay, Fadr Bohuna, what are you going to do if she is still recalcitrant? She is still does not want to come under your authority, which is also, in the, this is for the conjugal relationships. What are you going to do? Spend the rest of your life beating her? No, that's not going to happen. This is when the Ayah 35 talked about shiqaq. Shiqaq is irreconcilable differences. These people are not. Okay. So what do we do? Once that didn't work, there is no beating, there is no talking between the two. And if you fear dissension between the two, send an arbitrator from his people and an arbitrator from her people. If they both desire reconciliation, Allah will cause it between them. Indeed, Allah is ever knowing and acquainted with all things. So here, حَكَمُ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمُ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا Two arbiters. Okay? They will sit. And if they both see, well, these two people, it is not going to be good for the family as a whole. If they are going to be bickering at each other and one is beating the other, what kind of life is that? They will go to court 
usually the court will appoint them now the court will appoint them because before they are appointed by the families now the court usually appoints those two uh, arbiters and when they come to the court and say well this is irreconcilable these two people should go usually the man will say no i i i'm not gonna let go in this instance then the judge will divorce the woman on behalf of the man. If he refuses to utter the divorce word, then the judge is going to divorce him. So there is a mechanism right below this Ayah 34. The 30, Ayah 35 has a mechanism for ending. Whether it's reconciliation, if both agreed, because the arbiters are going to talk to them. If they both agreed, well, that was for a certain thing that happened. We lived with each other five years. Fine. Something happened, interrupted the tranquility. And we will go and fix it. So fine. That's it. But if it is irreconcilable and those two arbiters are saying, hey, irreconcilable, then the judge is going to uh, give the woman a divorce. Okay, and the shoes in language is to go above. Yeah, but what they just Okay. So I think I put it somewhere here. Yeah. And, and, and that is, I think, the proper word that is now used. And instead of uh, uh, arrogance, some people uh, try to, uh, to interpret it or translate it into arrogance, bad behavior. Uh, but it is, you know, refusal to perform the conjugal duties. Exactly. Go. Not, the, not disobedience. It is. Yeah, a recalcitrant wife is someone who goes above the authority. Yeah, so that's what it means. So then first you do the advising and talking does not work, then you can, you know, sleep in separate, uh, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe she, she will go back to her senses and then, you know. Uh, and there's also about the shoes of the man, he's mentioned somewhere else that. Yes, but the, 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 the shoes of the man, the man though, yeah. is treated differently. And some men, some men do not go with what the will of God when he said, try to reconcile with her. Okay. So then, uh, or the woman, for example, he is saying, I'm going to get another wife. And she said, well, you can have my car, but don't marry. I will say, okay, fine, your car is better than mine, and I'm going to take your car, and, and I won't. Two years later, he comes back and says, well, I think I'm still on the idea of getting married. Give me your house, your house. And it happened many times, and then she will give him the house. So some men make it a way to get rich, while the idea is reconciliation here because the man has been given you know the, all these rights don't come just naturally between a man and a woman okay uh, if uh, uh, you are the wife of someone here then that someone is is the one who a one he is spending his money on you, okay? And also because in Sharia, something that we always forget, but look up any, um, any family law in the Muslim world. 
when it comes to the duties of the wife, you don't find that she is to cook and to wash and to clean the house. No, these are not her duties. A marriage of contract does not contain that. So also beware. If you are spending your money, she is doing something else. Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu was uh, going out of his house and his wife was known for her huge house and she's always screaming at him. And one day one of his friends say, um, Umar, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a shaitan is afraid of you. Why are you letting this woman scream at you that way? He said, well, she cleans my house. She cooks my food. She even combs my hair. She washes my clothes. So he uh, told him everything that she does at the house. And it is not any of her duties. Can't I just take something from her? Because she does all this for me. So here, even when we say, okay, the man is spending his money, the man should look and see what is the woman doing there. She's not just sitting there receiving money. It could happen if he is filthy rich. <laughs> but otherwise, they are doing everything. And some of the some of the laws, some of the Islamic laws would tell the man if he is divorcing the woman. He's going not to pay her compensation for only three months. She's going to compensate her for all the years that she was serving in his house. Okay. I think the word Yeshua has got a lot of meaning in the Arabic language more than we talk about. Yeshua is for women and men mm -hmm. a lot. The word Yeshua is not simple. That, that, that's true. That is why there are consequences. Can you repeat that comment for us? Which one? Uh, he said the word shoes has a meaning more than we think of. We think of it is, you know, or authority, but it has more meaning. And you you could uh, you could say the meanings. Issues, mm -hmm. it's a lot, really a lot. Okay. Not only the woman or one thing like that, it's more than disobedience. We talk about uh, here cooking and whatever for the woman. I think that a man go out and do his job, uh, did what is needs to be done, and see this is and take care of the children, wife and stuff like that. It is a job. So the wife should be the same way. She can cook, that's a good everybody got a certain job. Even when husband work and the woman work, they exchange the duties and he does this and she does that and stuff like that in the books. But for the woman who's sitting at home, that's a job like the man's house job. We shoes I'm talking about this disobedience, uh, going out of my roof of, of the knowing. It's, no, it's actually, I cannot even say uh, what should means in general. It's a big word for a man, for a, for a man, for a woman especially, and for a man. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, really, Thank you. Okay. That is, uh, you know, they say, uh, they say if uh, you uh, if uh, he can afford it, he should get the remain. So it's not like her job to do the cooking, to do the cleaning, to do that. So he just has to make her life easier. So it's not like you have to clean, I have to work outside. It's just their marriage is just to be protectors of each other. Exactly. And that is going with the time. That is exactly what we mean by going with the time. If they are both work. If they both working, okay? Okay, with two salaries, we can get a mate. 
uh, even if for uh, for the weekend to clean up or to cook or anything okay fine so when when there is no discord uh, in islam when there is no discord people can do what is useful for them what fits their life in their home yes what, what, what did Amul Khattab do that made his wife scream at him? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I actually don't know. Oh, okay. okay, but because um, Omar ibn al Khattab is used to be tough. Yeah, he was a tough man. Some probably he got tough on something that didn't need to be tough on. So she started to just say. Or, or sometimes women don't like men going into their business or asking them, when are you going to wash the clothes? I'm washing the clothes all the time, so get out. Okay. So. <laughs> well, exactly. You make a mess in the kitchen. That's right. But with life going on, people, Muslim people can order their life, live it the way that suits them, the way that makes them comfortable. Whether it is spending money or just doing free services or, or share uh, uh, the uh, driving kids to school. Okay, You find that some, people, some men will drive their kids to school from kindergarten to high school, he has to go put everyone in their school and then go to work. And in that, that prevents discord in the family. That's fine. Why not? Some men cook. Why not? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to not to cook, but he would help. If there are vegetables to be cut or anything, he would do it. So anything that keeps tranquility in the family is allowed. There is no, in, the, in Islam, it's not like uh, like you said, it's not like the woman has to do this, the man has to do this. The only Allah said they are protectors of each other. There is, of course, you know, the respect and who takes care financially, okay? Just so, so like, but not the man say, oh, you're not working, so I'm not going to feed you or something like that. So that's it. But anything else, you know, there is, uh, as long as they are agreeing on on their life, so there's no problem. Exactly. Do is, it. I mean, is the hay and the Quran, is our job to do the school will I like, hear? Second time, get the microphone. Yeah. So people can hear you. Yeah. 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 So yeah. In the Quran, is an A. What? Sakina. Sakina. Let's go. That that means a lot. It means a lot. Exactly. And there is who will shut up. Who will help. Who will you're doing what needs to be done. And Muslim Sharana take care of the children with her. Take them to school sometime. Uh, with them what they are there, uh, you know, school time or clothing or whatever. The school is more than a normal word. So when the, the word comes to school, that means both of them, the man equal to the woman and the woman equal to the man. Okay. Kuna labasun lakum wa antum labasun lahunna. في كل الخطاب الخطاب دائما في معظم الآيات القرآنية الخطاب للإسلام. الخطاب للمرأة وللرجل السكون هي القصد من القصد من الزواج نفسه أنه الإنسان يعيش هذه الحياة العائلية في, الـ 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 في, في بعض المفسرين بيقولوا مثلا كان في ولاية الإجبار ولاية الإجبار اللي هي ليست جزء من الشريعة وليست جزء من الإسلام ولاية الإجبار أن تجبر ابنتك أو من أنت وليا عليها أن تتزوج أحد الناس وتجبره العادات والتقاليد بتقول البنت ما تقول لا 
ولا تروح المحكمة عشان تفسخ الزواج لأن الزواج في بهذه الطريقة إذا ما في إف سوري I just turned into Arabic or something because uh, there has to be consent in the marriage but suppose that a woman did not consent to the marriage but then she succumbed to the uh, 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 order of her bully whether he is a father or anyone else the man is, and she is doing everything in the house. She is keeping everything tidy. She is keeping her duties toward her husband. Some men will say, why, why do you hate me? Why can't you love me? That is not allowed. And that is not a reason to beat a wife. You can never beat a wife that does everything for you, but why can't you love me? Well, I can't love you because I was forced to come to live with you. But I am doing everything I am supposed to do. And because the heart, what is in the heart, is not in control. We are not in control of that, right? You can't control these uh, passions or these feelings. So you can't force someone to do it for them. Something like that. In Sudan and Egypt and all the uh, Muslim world, actually call it Hukm in the 60s. That was Hukm Ta, which uh, the husband got the right to put the woman in a place which is ugly, no water, no nothing, and just like a, a, a mm. you know, a, a signal, like a, you know. A, yeah, but a, but the Ta, the Ta in law. It has to be a suitable place to live yeah. in, with water, with food, with everything. But now, the women have the right to end on the, the marriage by saying, what? Hula. Oh, these, these are, there are so many dissolutions. Yeah. There are, uh, to dissolve a marriage by divorce, that is one. Hula. Uh, talaq al amal, uh, which is similar to the uh, to the uh, uh, right. Okay, but our laws are not allowing that to come automatically. You can't just tell them you have to go to court uh, and no, stay for years in court to get a divorce. I'm going to say something about Egypt. Now is a law. Uh, the law says. If the man wanted to get married to another woman with his wife, he has to, to pay for, to get the uh, the woman, the wife, I mean, agreement to do that. If she doesn't agree, he can never marry another woman. That's the law we should know. Exactly. These laws, see, our, even our laws are going with the time. Okay. Yeah. okay. It used to be uh, in the Sudan and Egypt, it used to be if the judge said, you have to go back to your matrimonial home. They will send the police after the woman. Yeah, yeah. And she will get her, put her in the yeah. police car and drive her to Gaza. Yeah. Now that is not happening. Neither yeah. in Egypt nor in the Sudan. However, the judges still have the right to pass a judgment of yeah. ta'a. Yeah. But then it is not enforceable. Yeah. Yeah. You can't execute it. A judgment of what? The judge can still order the woman to ta to go to her matrimonial home. To return to her husband? Yes. But right. today, that's the case? Uh, today that is the case, but it is not executable. And then at that time, when she doesn't execute the court order, she's called a nashes. Or a nashes, she will be a nashes, happens when she refuses to go, to go back to them. And in that, uh, the judge could immediately say, okay, that is total discord. Let us divorce her. No, she has to go and wait for a year or six months or whatever the law says, and then come back to the court to ask for the divorce. So it is always difficult on the woman. Who, um, a man can divorce his wife anytime he wants. But what, I know is what, what if they are poor? And she doesn't have anything to give in khula. Yeah, no. 
I mean, okay, she, she lives with the uh, birth of recovery, birth of income, whatever, and we get the full. So that's okay, okay for the women now to go to court and divorce the husband. Yeah. I think this is, uh, the problem is these are these. What you're saying is like uh, there's there's some contradiction to these laws, some contradictions to uh, to Islam. Okay, uh, I know that there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that there's a woman came to him and said, uh, "I want to divorce my I I don't want to stay with my husband." He said, "What's the reason?" She she said, "He's you know he's very nice. Uh, you know he's not hurting me or doing anything." I just don't love him. I just don't think he's very appealing. So he said, then if you cannot stay with him, give him back al -haid. What the, You know, he gave her a piece of land. Just give him back the land he gave you, and it will be over. So it was not like, you know, staying one year or two years. So if we talk about, we go back to the Sunnah or and the... Uh, you know what, the Quran, the, these things are all laws. Well, there is, there is something, there is something better. There is something better than the khulh in, in, in uh, sharia generally. There is something better than the khulh. It's called tafwil, delegation. At the time of contracting the marriage, the woman would ask to have the right of divorce delegated to her. But also it is not automatic like it is the right of the man because they said uh, divorce for the man is an original right. He can... She has to go to court also and say, well, I have a tough will from him to, do, to ask for a divorce, not to divorce him. To this date, a woman cannot divorce a man. The man divorces a woman. So she goes to court to ask that this man divorce her. But well, the man has to, to do the same. The man, if you want to divorce his wife, he go to divorce him in court or with the wife who got the agreement to get married. Mm -hmm. The ma'zoon. Do? The ma'zoon, that the, the person in charge of marrying people. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they go him and he does the divorce. That is what the man wants a divorce. Yeah. When the man wants it, but a woman cannot go to the ma'zoon and no. ask for a divorce. She has to go to court. Is, is the tafwil something similar to the current, uh, today's prenuptial agreement? Almost. It is out of way to do uh, the pre nuptial agreement talks even about the uh, uh, financial rights. Okay. About what she does and what he does. It's, it's, sometimes it is long. Sometimes it is. Uh, at is in the case of divorce for the woman. And we used to have the contract that just has the name of the wife, the name of the, uh, the, the, name of the uh, guardian. Because, for example, in Malikia, in the Sudan, in other places, in Saudi Arabia, uh, the woman does not contract her marriage. Despite the fact that the law on first page says uh, marriage is a contract between a man and a woman. I know in the Sudan that marriage is a contract between two men, the guardian and the husband. A woman has nothing to do with contracting the marriage. Okay? Oh, no. Any age. Any age. And even if, you, if she is divorced and remarrying someone else, it goes for, for, for everyone. They, a woman has to have a guardian for everything. That's only in Sudan, you said. And Saudi Arabia. And Saudi. That is, uh, I don't know about yes. Yemen, uh, whether they have a guardian rule, because it used to be all over the place, but people, you know, is that an Islamic issue or is that a traditional issue? It's for, it depends on which mazhab you are talking about. Al Hanafiya, uh, when the Ottoman Empire came into Northern uh, uh, Africa, including the Sudan, they brought Al Mazhab Al Hanafi. And, however, the Sudanese are by a large Malikiya. So they had to take that, a woman could contract her own marriage and replace it with a guardian has to do the marriage. Okay. Exactly. It, it depends on which mazhab you are applying in your law. Okay. 
Yeah, a shepherd. You said something about the man. How about the shepherd? Well, I I don't know the only the only mishap that allows uh, uh, a woman to contract her own marriage, a woman to be a judge in some cases, is a Hanafi mishap. Okay, uh, Malik is a little bit strict on this. Malik says no marriage without a wali, no marriage without a guardian. Okay. <laughs> بالرغم من انه ها yes she still needs a guardian to contract the marriage okay. it used to be the the uh, the remarry a divorced woman who is remarrying um where uh, it used to be a, a woman or even a child cannot marry without the wali and the wali can actually marry her and then come back to tell her okay but in case of a sayyib a divorced woman who is remarrying she has to show her consent expressly okay Yeah. Done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.